Shiny white ice sheets reflect the incoming sunlight, keeping things cooler. When the temperature warms up, some of that ice sheet goes away, more of that light goes to the underlying water and land, which absorbs it better than the shiny white ice sheet. Therefore, temperatures go up. Therefore, more ice gets melted. Therefore, more heat gets trapped. More ice is melted. More heat gets trapped. At the bottom of the ocean is trapped a huge amount of methane, CH4, which is a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. There just doesn't happen to be as much of it in the atmosphere. This is trapped down here in sort of an icy formation. It's sort of trapped inside some, some molecular cages of water molecules, kept there by pressure and temperature. It's kind of complicated, but it's possible that as the water temperature increases, the conditions for these become more hostile. They melt, releasing the methane, which then migrates to the surface, ends up in the atmosphere where it does its greenhouse thing, which is to trap more heat from the sun, which increases temperatures, which melts more of this, which releases more methane, etc. In fact, there's a scary hypothesis out there. It's beyond conjecture. It's up to hypothesis called the methane hydrate gun, where there's some evidence, some, some hypothesis that in the past, this happened very suddenly, like actually in an eruption that you could see uh, the water, the bubbles coming out of the water and created a tremendously abrupt change in the climate in the past. Um, there's, not, there's not solid evidence for that, but it looks like that, that may be a possibility, which would be really scary. Near the surface of the ocean, the phytoplankton, just like land plants, use photosynthesis to split the carbon dioxide from the air, keeping the carbon to build themselves, eventually dying and sinking the carbon to the bottom of the ocean, taking it out of the atmosphere, and splitting off the oxygen and spitting it out for us to breathe. We like them. They are good for us. In fact, they are responsible for about half of the globe's photosynthesis, half of the globe's oxygen production, half of the uh, globe's sequestration of organic carbon. They need, in order to live, they need the nutrients that well up from the cold water down at the bottom of the ocean. If the surface of the ocean warms a bit, that increases the thermal stratification of the ocean, which decreases the mixing and this upwelling, upwelling of cold water with nutrients that are required for these phytoplankton, which means that fewer of the phytoplankton thrive, which means there are fewer of them to take carbon dioxide out of the air, which means more carbon dioxide stays in the air, which means things get warmer. And there's the start of the feedback cycle because that warms this, that increases the thermal stratification, reduces the upwelling, reduces the number of phytoplankton, reduces the amount of carbon dioxide, etc., etc. Warmer temperatures allow permafrost to thaw, which releases methane and carbon dioxide stored there, which goes into the air, which traps heat, which increases the temperature, which melts more permafrost, causing more release of the greenhouse gases. Same thing happens with uh, peat bogs that aren't necessarily um, frozen, but as they warm up, the biological um, decomposition happens faster, which releases more carbon in the form of methane and carbon dioxide faster. So both peat bogs and permafrost are part of this type of feedback cycle where warmer temperatures releases more greenhouse gases, causing more temperatures, higher temperatures, releasing more greenhouse gases. Welcome to the North Atlantic. You've probably heard about the ocean conveyor belt. This is the North Atlantic where we get water coming up, part of a big ocean circulation. The main part we care about is that at the ocean surface, the ocean takes up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, both as dissolved CO2 gas and in the form of carbon taken in by photosynthesis by our little friends, the phytoplankton. Both forms of carbon end up getting sequestered or locked away at the bottom of the ocean by this part of the conveyor belt in the North Atlantic, which sinks at some billions of gallons of water every second taking a whole bunch of carbon down with it. Why this concerns us is because this water sinks because it's cold and salty. And the problem is as temperatures rise and we get ice on land that starts to melt, that fresh water comes in and reduces the saltiness of the North Atlantic, which means it's less likely to sink. The warmer it is, the more this slows down. And the more this slows down, the slower the carbon is taken out of the air and sequestered in the bottom of the ocean. In fact, there appears to be a danger, and it seems to have happened in the past, that the whole thing shut down uh, all at once. Well, that's a problem for two things, for two reasons. One is it's the ocean conveyor that keeps um, England and Northern Europe at a decent temperature, a moderate temperature. They're actually at the same latitude about as southern Siberia. So it's bringing up a temperature from the temperate latitudes down near the equator. So if it shuts off, that's where you get actually a mini ice age or a cold spell 
cold climate in northern Europe. The other big concern is if the ocean conveyor happens to shut off, that's suddenly a mechanism that used to take a whole bunch of carbon, sorry, whole bunch of carbon out of the air and stick it down at the bottom. Remember our carbon balance with the oceans? They take in 92 gigatons a year. They give out 90. They actually take in a net amount of 2 gigatons of carbon a year. If this shuts down, a lot of that goes away and it goes back to being in equilibrium. This might shut down rapidly because right over here, just behind England, is a huge ice sheet called Greenland. And this is why we're so concerned about Greenland. And you hear Greenland this, Greenland that. Not just because if Greenland melts, it increases the volume of the water and raises sea levels. But if Greenland melts catastrophically, suddenly, it floods the North Atlantic with fresh water and makes it very likely that the ocean conveyor will shut down, tripping off another feedback cycle, which makes the warming even worse. Forests can give rise to the same feedback mechanism as the phytoplankton do. As the climate changes, a forest may find itself in a climate that stresses it out, increasing disease, allowing more insect attacks, and eventually you have a significant part of the forest die, or perhaps the whole thing in extreme cases. So it stops taking in as much CO2 out of the atmosphere as it did, allowing temperatures to rise, leading to more dead trees, and so on. But it gets worse, because if you have an entire forest standing dead, it's just a matter of time before a lightning strike sets off a massive wildfire, releasing back into the atmosphere all the carbon that used to make up the trees. Not only does the forest stop taking carbon out of the air, it can actually emit carbon back into the air that was already handily sequestered. If feedback mechanisms don't have you scared enough for your own good, then there's also the concept of maskings. These are dynamics which keep the warming smaller than it otherwise would be. That's a good thing in the short run. But the problem is, if the masking gets used up or stops working, then the effects of global warming will accelerate faster than we expected. These maskings have been compared to coiled springs. They take up some of the shock now, but if used too much, when, when, when they let go, we get a nasty backlash. Such maskings include the global dimming effect provided by aerosols. Aerosols are these little tiny particles of stuff that our activities have put into the air, sort of like air pollution. So if this is the Earth and this is the layer of our atmosphere and here's happy Mr. Sun, aerosols are things that we release, these tiny little particles, and what they effectively do is they act sort of like a global sunscreen. And they will reflect, they will absorb and then re-radiate some of the sun's light, preventing it from getting down to the ground. So they have a masking effect. In this case, it's a positive thing, this kind of air pollution, because it keeps some of the sun's heat from getting to us. An ironic part is, once we start to clean up the traditional air pollution, then these aerosols decrease, which means they no longer block that energy, and more of the sun's energy gets down to the earth in order to be trapped by the regular greenhouse gases. So these aerosols are probably masking some of the warming we're causing currently by blocking some of the light. But if that masking goes away, then our, the effect can spring back on us without, um, without us seeing it coming because it's sort of stored up. That's totally not true. Cut that. Another masking effect comes from what are called carbon sinks, like the oceans or forests, where we sink carbon in. They have a net intake of carbon. You may, you may recall from the video Mechanics of Climate Change that our activities emit about 7 gigatons of carbon every year, but only about 3 of that ends up hanging out in the air doing its greenhouse thing. About 2 of that gets sequestered into the ocean, and another 2 goes, we don't know where. So this is a good thing because it mitigates the greenhouse effect that our emissions would otherwise have. It masks it, so instead of there being 5 gigatons of carbon emitted every year, there's only three in order to contribute to the greenhouse effect and global warming. The problem is, in addition to, or rather as part of the feedback cycle of the ocean that I mentioned just a minute ago, this acts like a sponge, like a sink, and we don't know what its capacity is. We don't know how much we can put in before it gets filled up or saturated, but it does have a finite capacity. It can't do this forever. So someday, probably quite suddenly, that may stop. Sorry, someday that will stop, quite possibly, suddenly. So what happens to that two gigatons of carbon? Well, now suddenly, it's back up here in the air. So now, instead of us emitting a net three gigatons a year, we are emitting a net five gigatons a year without us changing our activities at all. It's sort of like the goalposts being moved when we already think we're doing everything we possibly can to reduce carbon emissions, and suddenly our net carbon emissions are doubled through no actions of our own, no direct actions of our own. And it gets worse than that. 